Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm an alcoholic, and um, I just thank you for all being here and to everyone that put on the conference. This is my first time um, being at this conference or any conference, so I'm very excited to be here. I did not know I'd be speaking either, so um, just going going for it. Um, I have um, a little over a year sober. My sober date is August 1st of 2000. And I've been trying to get sober for about 10 years, and it's been a a struggle. I kind of had labeled myself a chronic relapser and didn't know if I would ever truly get this and be able to live a life in sobriety. Um, So I was... uh, just told to kind of share my experience with the third step, which um, I'm working through the steps right now with my sponsor. Um, I'm on step four, so I I think I have a little bit of experience with the third step. It's pretty raw and fresh, but um, the the thing I was thinking about too is I, I feel like, you know, I have a couple different experiences starting to work the steps and <clears throat> being in the rooms and um, I guess, you know, just from personal experience, I do know that I had a defining moment and it wasn't necessarily, you know, I did have a defining moment when I said the third step prayer with my sponsor reading through the book, but I believe that internally when I made the decision to, um, to really change, that's when it took place. Um, and for me, um, I had to hit a pretty um, low rock bottom. I have been separated from my daughter, who's now seven, um, since she was about four and a half. Um, and I've been trying to get sober for her for a long time, and it hasn't worked. And it's just, it really, really um, just beat down my spirit. And I... Um, you know, felt more and more guilt and shame and, um, helpless, hopelessness. And I had, um, just a self will that was (laughs) completely out of control. Um, and I was still holding on, I think to a lot of anger and resentment and, um, but I reached a point last summer where I, had been using and drinking for about five or six months straight. And, um, I had been up for several days, um, after methamphetamine binge and drinking and completely delusional, um, and decided I was on the streets and I decided I was going to end my life. And, um, in a moment I heard, and it just, it wasn't my voice, <laughs> but I, I just had the thought, um, that I had the option to get help. And I do remember from a prior overdose when I was at, when I came to in the ER, a nurse telling me, if you ever need help, you can come back here. And that just echoed in my mind. Um, and that's a miracle to me because I was completely out of my mind in that moment. And I, as soon as that thought came in, it's like I was on a mission to get to the hospital and save my life. And it was um, like I was sprinting there practically. Uh, I remember when I was packing for this conference, I was looking for my sleeping bag and I had this REI sleeping bag and I was carrying around like kind of like a backpack, so the strings and I was like, where is that sleeping bag? I know I have one. And then I remembered when I was sprinting to the hospital, I kind of had this thought in my mind, like I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to get help where I'm going. I don't need this. And I just <laughs> threw it. <laughs> and that was like the last of my possession. <laughs> and, um, and I, uh, 
it's just funny how it came, that story came in my mind yes, the, yeah, yesterday when I was getting, or the other day, and I ordered one on Amazon real quick, but um, it's somewhere in Seattle, maybe, but um, I am so glad that, you know, I became willing in that moment to listen to that voice and that thought. Um, I went to the hospital and I called my sponsor that I hadn't talked to in about five or six months. Um, and that was the first person I called because I knew that um, she had an answer for me, you know, that that's where I'd find some kind of, um, uh, you know, some truth and that I needed, I needed help. And um, so that's, that's where I see like a big turning point where I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to God because I knew that what I was doing was not working and I was going to end up dead. And, um, but, um, as I continue in the program, I see it as an ongoing decision that I make every day to turn my will over. And it started really simple. Like, even just the thought of that, like, really gives me anxiety. So I'm like, what is God's will? What is my will? How do I know the difference? How do I, like, test this out? And like, um, But it, I just simplified it, like, because I destroy myself. That's what I do. I almost make it, and then I go off the deep end. I, you know, time and time and time and time again. And I know God's will is for me to not do. Like, I know that much. I know his will is for me to live. I know that much. His will is for me to live even if I don't have my daughter, I realized. Even, you know, that I'm, that there's a purpose. And so I just start with that. And, um, and if I start with, like, God wants me alive and God doesn't want me to run from pain. I, for a long time, I was like, I... I'm done with pain. Like I felt enough pain in my life. Like I'm just done with that. I'm going to blot out all pain. And, um, God wants me to heal from pain. He wants me to be like healed so that I can be of use to others and help others heal. And I was just, um, swimming around in it and trying to avoid it. What do they say? Like what you, um, uh, kind of like, you know, whatever you're putting off, just, um, it just ends up coming back tenfold. And so I've been every, every day just looking at like, how can I, um, heal and grow and there might be pain involved and that's okay. Cause I know that, uh, I'm not alone and I can get through it. And I think that was a big fear of being alone and I don't feel alone today. And um, I can't remember what else I was going to say, but I, uh, um, but basically I just stick to the basics. God wants me alive. He wants me to um, do good things, to not destroy myself and kind of like, Remember those bracelets? Like, what would Jesus do? It's like, <laughs> those are kind of awesome in a way. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, what, not what would Sarah do? So I've been doing the opposite. Pretty much whatever my go-to is, I'm like, I'll do the opposite of that. Or start with that and see if that's God's will. Because probably what mine is, is not. Um, <laughs> truly. Like, even being at this conference is um, new for me, like my go-to is to isolate and hide and not let anyone know I have problems, not let anyone know that I don't have my daughter, but that doesn't help anybody and it's not helping me. So, um, just, just super happy to be here. I don't think I have anything else to share, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, Colter. Hi, my name is Coulter, and I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, man. Like, I, I've just been super nervous about this. Um, 
so I called my brother. I was like, oh, they, they want me to speak. They want me to say something. I was like, the third step, that's the one where I give my life to God, right? And uh, he's like, yeah, dude, you, you already know that. And I was like, yeah, well, I don't know, man. I was doing pretty good by myself, you know what I mean? <laughs> No, but in reality, like, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've been to, I've been to them psych wards. I've been to them sanitariums all over the place where, where like, I'm a certified degenerate. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't belong in society very well. But now I have a job. I have a home group. I've been sober for a little while like three, almost three years. And, um, and, uh, and it's just crazy. Like, um, but you know what my sponsor said? He said, you know, you always talk about culture. You always talk about, first of all, you always talk about yourself. And I was like, well, you you got me there. And, and, uh, (laughs) and, and you always talk about, oh, you, you're the psychopath, you know, like you really got issues upstairs. And, and, you know, for a long time, I thought, uh, you know, I was, it was somewhere in between me thinking MI6 was going to come and kill me because I was a reptilian shapeshifter. <laughs> and it was somewhere between that and when I resurrected John Gotti from the grave and sent him to heaven that I realized that, like, that this is all in my head, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, that's that's a good example of self will run riot, you know what? The riot lasted a very long time in my case. Um, So this is my favorite step. I don't really know much to say on it. I just think that, like, I had to give it all the way away. Like, I couldn't be... It's kind of like if you're baking a cake, you know what I mean? Like, you got to bake the cake. You can't, like, add a bunch of, like, extra random ingredients into the... Like, there's a way to bake the cake... And I think I had to give it, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I had to give, I had to give it all the way. You know what I mean? I had to, uh, I couldn't be in that equation. And that was like really helpful to me because I was on a big losing streak, you know? Um, and I, and I just, I just feel super honored to be at this conference because, you know, I'm just kind of like the young gun, you know, like I want to learn. I want to like give it a, I don't want to run the show anymore you know what I mean like that shit's lonely and um but it's also like um it's a tremendous opportunity to be of service to other people cause you know I took for so long I took for my family I got a younger brother you know, I got a family, and, and I get to talk to them now, and and, they, and about their days. You know how they how they get get through the day, and I don't know. Like it's just crazy. Like once I gave my my will over to God, uh, I've just witnessed, I've been experienced like a lot of crazy, like but not crazy, like very sane, <laughs> like. <laughs> You know, very sane. Like everybody's doing well, and even when, and even when it's not like going exactly how I want to, I remind myself that's a good thing because you know, mm, yeah, that's a good thing. And um, so I I stopped saying it for a while though. You know, like I I took my my third step prayer very seriously, and I was very serious about it. I was like, mm, I meant every word of it. So I guess you know. Mm, I'm good. Um, but I just like to remind myself that I get to do that every day, that I get to just be like, here you go, God. Um, and we may just, just maybe just live happily ever after in this world that God created. I didn't even create nothing, but somehow I think I own the place when I walk into the room <laughs> and it's really delusional thinking, you know, and I, um, I don't know if any, you know, I bet everyone can relate just a little bit to that. Uh, but it's, it, it's an old mentality. And what I realized that, um, 
all these like old mental spaces, these old belief systems that stopped working when I was, I don't know, they probably stopped working when I was like six or seven, but I carried them out into like my teens and early twenties and, you know, and I, and I, I, I just, I can't wait to talk about the fourth, like to other people talk about the fourth step because as soon as I gave my will and my life over to God, you know, the book had this plan, you know, like, okay, you do that. That's like a decision to do the rest of the steps. Right. And, um, as soon as I did that, you know, I, I went to work and I, I just felt like I was a soldier in the trenches for God. I wasn't, and I felt like I had a, like I was, I move my body, I speak my words, but it doesn't feel like it's me, you know, but sometimes it does, but you know, for the most part, I feel like I'm, if I'm not in the equation, it's a good day. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Colby, for sharing. And now uh, for third panelist, um, Randy. Thank you, Luis. Uh, my name is Randy, and I am a grateful member of Al-Anon. And it's good to be with all of you here today in the Fellowship of the Spirit, and to be what a joy to be on sharing the stage with all these folks and to be a part of this group that's been so important to me in my recovery and in my life um, for many years. Um, the third step, being convinced. We were at step three, right? What am I convinced of, right? And also being convinced, right? If I'm not convinced, when I get to that part of the book, right, there's no sense of me continuing on, even though I'm hard-headed and I uh, think that I know. But if I'm not convinced, what comes after is not going to impact my life in the way that... Um, I want it to, and as I get, you know, various warnings throughout the next few pages about, you know, what it means to be honest, what it means to give myself um, over to a higher power, um, to God as I understand God, um, and really what that means, and what the, when I get to that prayer at the end of the step, you know, what does that mean for me? How do I understand that so that I can go ahead and take that action, right? And so I had a lot that I needed to, to think about in those few pages as I sat down with my sponsor and worked through those, right? But being convinced is super important for me because I am also a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had a lot of long-term, I don't know, whatever that means, but I was in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time before I came to Al-Anon. When I moved to Washington in 2016, uh, the summer of 2016, and I met my uh, the man who became my AA sponsor in um, rooms up there. Um, and then, like a week and a half later or something, he's taking me to Fort Warden for Northwest Fox. Um, you know, and he picked me up and he opened up the back. I didn't, I didn't know him. I didn't, everybody else knew him, but I didn't know him at all. Or been in his car or any of these things and so now we're going to go on a trip um, to a conference um, on a ferry and he gets there and he opens up the back of his um, rig and there's a shovel in there and some <laughs> hefty bags <laughs> like where are you taking me <laughs> and he just cackles he cackles he cackled at me and but he got in the car and he took me over there and at that conference, you know, I had been sober for 14 years, and my life was not at a high point at that point in 2016. And I was introduced to Al-Anon at that conference. And there were people, Al-Anons on the panel, and an Al-Anon speaker. And that whole weekend, I was just like, every time when Al-Anon spoke, I was like, oh my God, they're telling, that's me. They are telling that story, and I felt it in my heart in the same way that I felt the AA, you know. But then the conference ended on Sunday and I got back on the ferry and I went home, you know, and I talked to Brendan about taking what I learned there and taking that out into the world with me and to the people that I meet and all that stuff. And I started to do that, but I forgot all about Al-Anon as soon as I left Fort Worden. And that my commitment that I was going to go look up these Al-Anon meetings and everything. And so I went back in 2017 and I had the same experience. Like, wow, this, you know, and the same experience in 2018. 
and my life in certain areas had not improved and I was doing certain behaviors and I was practicing the principles as best as I could right um, you know but I had this block in me because I had helped people through the 12 steps of recovery and I had been carrying the message and I thought I knew some things about the world and recovery and all these things that I could not get across the line in this other fellowship, in this fellowship that's become so important for me. Um, and I didn't know what al was, even though I'd been listening to people talk about that, right? In my own life, I could always say, well, you know, it's not that bad, right? It's not as that bad, right? You know, and maybe if I just say the right thing, if I produce the right conditions, right? If, you know, I'm this will change. Their life will change. This person's life, who I haven't been married to for three years, <laughs> and we're so entangled and enmeshed, like if I just say the right thing, and, and if she just thinks about it in this context, or she hears this thing, that will be the thing that unlocks the door. But, it, you know, and I tried so hard, right? It talks in here about how we exert ourselves even more um, and we get dissatisfied when it doesn't turn out the way that we expect it to, that way we think it should look like, that this marriage should look like this, or this post-marriage should look like this, you know, um, for whatever reason, for the daughter, for the, you know, whatever. This needs to be, right? <laughs> but I came back in 2019, we're here now, um, and I had the experience, but it wasn't this time... You know, it was not a great time in my life, but if you had asked me, I would have told you I'm recovered, I'm doing all these things, I have a sponsee, I'm helping others, I have service, I'm doing these things which are super important and meaningful and were keeping me alive and in the rooms and in the middle so that I could hear when I needed to hear, right? Um, that would start that journey of being convinced, right? And strangely enough, this time it wasn't an al speaker at first. That came later. But there, like an AA speaker, I think, um, the 10 a.m. speaker on a Saturday, like, I don't know if you remember any of her talk, but her story is like, if only she heard this story, and if I gave her the CD, this would change her lives. Right. And now, during the course of this weekend, I had met a guy from Colorado who was now on, and I, I heard him show on a panel. We had a meal together and everything, and I was so jacked after that talk. Like, and I went up to him and I said, I'm going to get this CD and I'm going to give that to her. What, do, you, do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> Maybe more impolite than that, but um, that was the message that I heard, and that first being confronted by somebody telling me no in that way, right, that was the thread that began to unravel the bondage of self that had just gripped me when I thought that I was doing everything right and knew everything. And so that was my process of becoming convinced, right? And we were able to go from that point forward, you know, eventually I asked him to sponsor me. I knew that I needed help and that this guy could help me in a very short amount of time, you know, in sharing his experience with me. I was able to begin this other journey that has only made all of my recovery stronger and deeper and helped me understand again what that prayer is in the third step so that it's not just something that I say and know in my own language um, but it's something that I can try to live throughout each day as I carry that vision for me you know as I make decisions about my life and what my life is going to be like in any given moment right and that, you know, when we get together to talk about these kinds of things, this is for me, right? There are people in this room who have tried to give, who have been there to give the message, this message that we talk about this weekend to her. It's available to her, right? But it's not me. I'm not that messenger for her, which is a really hard thing for me 
armed with a big book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> charged up on the fellowship of the spirit, right, to understand. And so, you know, we began to talk about those things like that prepared me for the next step that comes after, right? Because as soon as I say that prayer, I have to go into action because that's what the next line is, there or thereabouts, right? And I get to see where, uh, but now I'm convinced, I'm saying my prayer, and I'm able to see with a new lens where I'm producing confusion, where uh, I am creating conditions, where I become the director again, right? And now understanding those kinds of things and taking that prayer on a daily basis, you know, I get to be um, the actor again. I get to, um, you know understand what those things mean so that I can put the focus on me so that I can live a different life. I can have a new experience that is healthy for me and for the people around me. Right. And so, um, what does that look like then, um, in my daily life, in addition to taking the steps, right. And to following through, right. As it becomes, as I understand it, I am making a commitment, as other people have said, to do this solution, right? This one here that is in this part of, you know, these, this book, right? Um, and not um, some other things. And so, you know, I go forth and I do what it says, and I begin to think about what I can contribute to life. I realized as I took the next step, um, which I know people are going to talk about this later, but I had that fear of today tomorrow and the hereafter and when I started working with my sponsor right when I thought it wasn't that bad right the next three to six months were probably the worst months of that whole experience of our lives right it got as low as it could go and if I had not begun this journey using these steps in this program with al -Anon, I just can't imagine the way um, it would have devastated all of our lives because I had stopped doing things that I had always done, that, you know, self-care, you know, um, going to God, putting God first, understanding that my worth is not centered in this other person or what they think of me, but it is centered in my relationship with God as I understand God, right? That's where... I get that. And the rest of the steps help me to make that connection and keep that connection and access that power that I had given away um, because I thought I knew when I didn't know. Um, you know, so life became a lot different as I began to think about this and um, step three and make a decision. So I found as I began to reflect on things that I would make decisions. Um, I would say the prayer, but then I would go out into my life and I would forget what I had done that morning and forget to check in with um, the fellowship that had grown up around me. And um, my life began to get very, very small, right, before um, this happened, right? And I became a virtual hermit living in the woods in a barn, you know, outside of Lacano. It's not a barn. It will used to be a barn, and somebody made it into <laughs> a cottage. But um, I just, you know, I got used to, you know, and I didn't understand really how great that was where I lived, um, you know, until I started doing some work in here, and I began to transform my relationship with my, like my physical place where I was and the people that were around me. Right, and it transforms my relationship with um, the alcoholics that I know and with the people that I meet. Um, so um, I don't know where I was going with that, but it's talking about like making this decision. Like when I I had stopped caring for myself. Okay, that's for me. And, and so I started to do things like um, you know my sponsor would say, well, why don't you walk to the mailbox? Like I was driving to the mailbox every day, <laughs> you know, um, and so I would walk to the mailbox. And that's, you know, my journey started doing that, you know, you know, and little by little, I started to bring God back into all my affairs in all segments of my life, 
right? Even this one with this person that I didn't even realize I had stopped inviting God into, right? Um, and so um, once I said this, honestly, right, I began to see um, where I had produced confusion in this world, and that is not my aim today, it is to be a producer of harmony, it is to be helpful, it is to be honest. And now, you know, my al sponsor knows everything about me, one conversation at a time, one step at a time through doing all of this work. My AA sponsor knows all about me as well, and they know each other, and they... <laughs> Maybe even talk to each other. I don't know. Um, but, you know, this step, I had to get over that hurdle of being convinced because I thought I knew what Al-Anon was. And I thought I could not be that person who um, was like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done in Alcoholics Anonymous? And don't you know what, who I've helped and all this stuff? Although if you looked at me in 2016 or 2019, you'd probably say, well, that guy does not have a solution. But I thought I did. And that's how cunning and baffling and powerful this disease is. And I'm so grateful that we have a solution and that we talk to each other. And this thing that came out of these living rooms where all us Alanons and AAs were mixed together at one time, right? That we get to recover together. And even when it's hard and we don't know what's going to happen, but we have this connection with our heart. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. So at this time, we'll open it up for those who would like to share some of their own experience with the third step. Um, or those questions for the speakers, please remember to speak directly in the microphone and limit your shares to three or four minutes so that more people have an opportunity to share. And we have a considerable amount of time, so. I'm Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. You guys have seen me, so you probably know that. Um, I had a, I had a bad experience with the third step. Um, I thought I was going to die because I was an atheist when I got here, and uh, you know they're all like, they were, I was listening. I was going to meetings where people were saying, you know, you got to turn your will and your life over to God before you go to the fourth step, because otherwise it's never going to. And I'm thinking, how the heck am I going to do that? I mean, you know, like I, I, you're asking me to move ahead, like I have to believe in something I don't believe in in order to go forward. And uh, even though my brain was completely scrambled, I still, you know, had spent a lot of time like developing an intellectual, logical brain and it just didn't add up, you know, like this was just not going to work. Um, and my sponsor, who was kind and loving, um, just said, you know, don't worry about God. We're going to go through the steps. You're going to do what I tell you. God will work itself out. And so when the fateful day that I had to do my third step came around, I uh, had been out of treatment for 30 days. And I was hoping we were going to do it right away because some guys at my home group did it basically right away in the parking lot. Like after five minutes, they did the third step and their sponsors handed them a piece of paper and a pencil and said, okay, get writing. Like that's how they did it where I, where I got sober. And, uh, and he didn't say that. He said, okay, we're going to work one, two, and three for the next 30 days. And I'm thinking, Shh. But, so I did what he told me to because my way doesn't work. And, uh, and that day came, and we went to a church, and we pulled out the big book where we read uh, how it works until we got to the part of the third step prayer. And I'm really nervous because uh, I don't believe in God and I'm going to do a third step prayer with my sponsor in the church. And we got down on our knees together and held hands and read that prayer out of the book together. And I was like, Ugh. and I got up. Um, and the first thing he said to me was, okay, I, he says, do you have any questions for me about God? No, no, dude, I don't have any questions about God. And he said, okay, well, he said, I got a question for you. And I said, what is it? He said, when are you going to do your fifth step? And being the 
you know, above average intelligent guy that I am. I said, you mean I got to have my four step done, right? And he said, yes, yeah, see, I knew you'd get this. You're a smart guy. <laughs> and we made a date for two weeks later, but that was it. I mean, that was my first, and when I walked out of that church, I didn't feel that great weight of the world lifted or any of that, you know, no, no breeze blowing through me. What I felt like was that I was a, a liar and a con artist, and I'm just making this stuff up, and if there was a God, I was going to get a lightning bolt thrown through the top of my head. But I did what he said, and it's three minutes, and you know what? I did what my sponsor told me to. I went through the steps, and I had a spiritual experience. That's the end of the story. Thanks very much. Kevin, I'm still an alcoholic. Um, this time I'll actually try to talk for more than 10 seconds and not break down crying. <laughs> so when I came in on November 29th, uh, 2021, um, I was standing, had in the process of losing that which was way more important to me than my drinking. So that's kind of what I consider my bottom. And I'm someone who, uh, I'm an engineer. I figure stuff out. And I design things. And I control things. And I construct and I maneuver. I manipulate. I lie. I, uh, I, I do these things. I'm excellent. At it. <laughs> and coming in, I was snapped in half. And it was, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> See Shelly there. She was there the day I came in. And it, it, I had nothing. And it was like, uh, do this. Like, but I was also in the Navy thing. And yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. So to make a decision to turn my will in my life over to the care of God as I understand him, absolutely, without a single hesitation, I've just been doing nothing but taking direction of others every single minute. Uh, I, I went on a four-day wilderness hike immediately before coming here. I came in here smelling like the wilderness. Um, and I did take a shower in the outdoor shower. Um, and I smell a little better now. Um, and I've been, uh, I, I spent half the time in the wilderness on my knees asking God for what is my next direction. Uh, I went to the chapel 20 minutes ago, or maybe it was an hour ago, and I was like, uh, God, uh, what am I supposed to do? I've got choice A or choice B, and what I heard was um, both. <laughs> it was like, pull your head out of your bottom, and uh, you can do this thing, and the other thing, it'll either happen or it won't happen. So, I, 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 I don't know, I'm just, I'm out of answers. I plan to never have answers again. And I just am taking direction and asking God every day. I did know the little interlude. I taught, uh, gosh, um, I hear people talk about what it took to, took to find God. And when I came into the meetings, a lot of folks were like, Oh, yeah, it took me losing everything to find God. And it's like, gosh, I, I've always had a relationship with God. And what I hadn't realized was when I was a little kid, I was sexually abused for years. And that time, I found God. And, and it was that uh, to... When you hear other people's stories, what do you relate to in their stories? What are you? What is similar, not different? Look for the similarities, not the differences. And I was scratching my head for the longest time. I was like, how come nobody else has found God a long time ago? Why did everybody else have to like, um, you know, live in a cardboard box and then find God? And it's like I've always had God. 
It's like, oh, well, in my own way, I had my own cardboard box as a kid and found God. But in, in, in that, I took that forward. I taught Sunday school for 10 years for a Catholic diocese. Um, I had the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I love that middle school age. Amazing kids. It's like you're, you're able to hopefully impart uh, tools and, and things to, to help them. And even then, I didn't have what I'm learning here. And it was the turning my will over to God. I never, even in those decades of, of teaching, I, ne- I woke up and first thing in the morning, I was like, what does Kevin want to do today? Oh, well, Kevin can do this cool thing and that cool thing and build this and design that and, and construct all these, these things. But I never was just like, how can I, how can I serve God today? How can I serve others? Um, and, and that's a changed experience for me. So I, I don't know, but at this second, I think this third step is, uh, this, this third step is me. Thanks everybody. My name is Patty and I am an alcoholic and I'm so happy to be here. And these first three steps, I love the panel because what I've learned is that when I got here, I was powerless. I had no power at all. But what I didn't know is that it wasn't just talking about my not being able to to drink. It was about I didn't have a power in my life greater than myself. And um, I didn't really want to stop drinking anyway because I knew I was insane. I knew about AA and I knew AA could help me. But what about the insanity? You know, I was crazy. And I've heard some stories about crazy up here um, through this this weekend. And I'll tell you what, yeah, I was crazy. And so what could you do for me? You know, if I came here, what could you do for me? And, you know, I've um, now gone through four sets of the big book and the 12th book. I've spent a number of 24 hours um, in a daily reprieve. And um, it doesn't matter how many years I've accumulated, but I do happen to have a coin on the front of my book that says 39 years. And, you know, the <laughs> I didn't do it. When I finally realize that this book, and my sponsor loves to do this to me. He says, he's going to do a topic for our our meeting, and he says, "Um, I've got one sentence for you. Read the book. And it's on page 112 in the the big book. And and then he called on me to to share on it. Read the book. I read the book all the time. Read the book. It's like that powerlessness and understanding what, what, where I was missing my power because I didn't have a higher power. I didn't trust anything. And my history goes a long ways back to Catholic school and all this other stuff. But, but the fact is, is that without this book and without all of you, I wouldn't have the next day to celebrate one more day of sobriety. I haven't had a drink in 39 years, but the insanity has come back because I'm crazy. You know, I need to work this program. And, um, you know, that idea of of, um, being um, self-reliant because, you know, I'm so smart and I know how to do things and I love doing things and, you know, I'm in service and blah, blah, blah. Well, none of that works if my insanity is full-blown again, and that means reaching out, touching out my higher power. And I, you know, one of the things is for me is that I have to have that connection with my higher power before my feet hit the floor. Because if they, if my feet hit the floor before I welcome my higher power into my life and turn it over, I will. I'm bad. Well, I won't say that. Um, I'm back to being crazy, and, and that's the way my day will go, and it'll go sideways. So, you know, I've got the reprieve of not having to have a drink, but I still have to read the book, follow directions, talk to my sponsor, 
spend time sponsoring. Um, and I happen to also be blessed with the idea that, that maybe I can actually be of general service work. And um, so this year, I've, for the last two years, we've been at JSR. And right now, we have a new virtual district. And um, I happen to be the treasurer of our virtual district. And um, I am so grateful that I've got the insanity put aside once in a while so I can actually participate in that general service. And I've got a lot of women that I work with that on um, um, workshops on um, actually doing general service work. And, and so it's just really awesome. Anyway, thank you so much. I kind of say that I really started the step works in, in step 11, but I drank around the clock for a while. I went to jail a little bit, and, and I had to do book reports on the big book on Anibus. So I, I understood the doctor's opinion well, and then I watched it happen, knowing it and stuff. So uh, on January 26, 1992, I got on my knees and I asked God for the power to carry this out because my thought process was, I need to do it your way, not mine. And I read how it works. And rarely have we seen a person go as thoroughly followed the past, blah, 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 blah. And I got to the end of the page and, and didn't know what I was reading. I, I couldn't remember anything. I, and I did that like three times. Mine was kind of foggy. And uh, I told that story for about 12 years. It dawned on me. The only thing I needed to know was that first sentence right there. It was rarely, you know, maybe I should follow the path. But I remembered a friend of mine that was helping me said that, um, you know, to get on my knees in the morning and ask God for the power to carry that out. And then. I was going to pray for myself, but somewhere I heard that I'm not supposed to pray for anything for myself, so I'm going to mess it up already. And then I remembered the 11th step said to pray only for the knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry it out. And I, and I had a pretty safe bet, even in my foggy condition, that to not drink was his will, and that's going to help you guys out too, like my parents and future employers. So that's all I asked for. And I haven't thought about taking a drink since then. I haven't taken a drink since then, more important. And, and like I said, it was January 26, 92. And, and what I really realized later going formally through these steps, looking at them a little closer, was that was my first third step. Because that was a surrender that like, God, what do you want me to do? I would do, you know, before that, there was no way I was doing a fourth step and telling you anything about a fifth step. And it was like, when do you want me to do it? Something radically changed. And it was just, I didn't want to be the way I was before that. And so now when I go to, I got to look at it a little deeper. Like my own boy says, if there's three frogs in a log and one decides to jump off and one jumps off, how many frogs are there? Whatever. He says, no, you know, say two. And he says, no, three, you just made a decision. And he say that the third step is just to make a decision. But that's what the outline says. That's not what the prayer said. It's actually a physical thing. It's a mental thing. It's an offer. And I have to offer myself to God. So I need to kind of get a little bit of a determination of what does that mean to me? You know, like, that's not me, obviously, it's God. And then, and then who the I am in that. So well, I'll take that meditation and do that word by word in each piece of that thing over and over and just chew on it and stuff. Like, and what I'm trying to get is I'm trying to get the bondage itself out of the way. Because that's like, like the mark that's here today might not be the one that I should be tomorrow. Or in 10 minutes from now, like, what does God want me to do next? And some mentioned it, like, really, that's what the stuff is really about. And, and future going forward is now that I'm not a drunk, and now that I've actually made these amends and stuff, like, what? why did God get me sober? I don't know about you, why did he get me sober? And I think it's to help other people. How, is, how does that form out tomorrow or today or in my job tomorrow and stuff? Actually, my job on the 6th, which is good. Nah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you guys. You know, the third step is third step is really one of my favorite um, steps, and every day I have to turn my will and my life over to a higher power. And uh, I just I like to share this reading from uh, um, it's one of our four four magazines about serenity prayer, and it's uh, from a gal in Israel. Her name is Shava, and. Uh, so it's finding peace in the serenity prayer. It says, God, I think of what my higher power means to me today. Grant. This means give me for free, not because I'm deserving, but because you are loving. Me, yes, me, little old imperfect me, the serenity 
the inner equilibrium necessary to be calm even in the situations which are turbulent and out of my control. To accept, to recognize the reality of the situation without protesting against it, letting go of my expectations, allowing it to be without panicking and letting go of the outcome. The things I cannot change, people, places, things, everything and everyone outside of me, courage, the strength to carry on even when I'm afraid or grieving or in pain, and to change, to modify or to make different. The things I can, my thoughts, my words, and my actions, and wisdom, the good judgment learned from my experience and the experience of strength of my from my uh, fellows in the program, to know, to recognize, to understand, and the difference. No one changes because of what I say or do. If people change, they have their own reasons. I cannot change anyone else. I can change. I can only change myself. Thank you. I didn't have a God that I understood. And, um, and so, and I'm, yeah, I'm a grateful member of Al Anon. Sometimes I wish I was an alcoholic because maybe I would have got to that dis- gift of desperation a little bit sooner. But we have this illusion that we can control our lives and that we can make other people better and that we can make ourselves better and that it won't hurt so much. And it takes a while to get to that point. Um, I've been in the program for two years. I've had um, experience with, you know, the um, um, an alcoholic living with a sober alcoholic in AA and going through the steps with him. So I was helping him through the steps, um, <laughs> but never really doing them for me. And so when I came to this. Um, this third step and um, turning my will in my life, make it, made a decision to turn my will in my life over the care of God as I understand God. And it's like, I don't understand God, but I'm willing to go to any lengths to get what you got, and get the serenity that you got and that I've seen and heard in the rooms in al And so that's what I do. And so instead of saying, let go and let God, I said, let go. There is a God. There is a higher power. It ain't me. And that's what I have come to a conclusion. And so thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.